Irish artist Roisin Cure is an author of three best-selling books. She went from being obsessed with 16th century artists at the age of seven, a popular kid winning art contests, to someone whose artworks and manuscripts were rejected countless of times. A roller coaster ride of highs and lows, yeses and noes. How did she remain confident to pursue art and serve the community through teaching? Well, if you'd like to hear more of her story, do join us as we discuss finding your own unique voice in art, getting over rejection and embracing failures, writing and drawing as a perfect combo one should pursue, art as an essential pillar for human connection, and why losing students in an art class is her measure for success. If you want to be part of the conversation, then send in your questions and topics you want us to cover to hello at etrolab.com. Hey, this is Jesse from Etcher. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. funny um journey in that I started when I was a very small child um I was only about four or five I suppose and by the age of seven um I was already trying to learn from the masters um so obviously my teachers weren't involved with that that was just me um I I was very obsessed with Bruegel for example um 16th century um artists from the low countries um <laughs> I was just really, really obsessed. I mean, I was a very little child and this beautiful work, it, it just made a huge impression on me. And I had a massive Bruegel poster on my bedroom wall. And I remember I just used to look at it every night and drink it in. And I think that that went a long way to forming my line and the way I draw now, because I'm not a million miles away from that style. Um, very strong outlines, very simple color palettes and full of people. So um, that would be very much something you see in Bruegel's work. And then um, I was about, I suppose, about eight when Tintin and Hergé came into my life, the work of Tintin. And um, again, I became extremely obsessed. And you have to remember in Ireland, there wasn't that that scene comics just didn't exist at all it still isn't huge in Ireland um in the way that it would be very big in France and in Belgium and in the continent in general so um so again that was very much self-directed um I was obsessed with how Hergé had managed to capture the line that he did um, and I discovered the secret. And, and then after that, um, Tintin came came into my world and I became very obsessed with uh, how on earth this line could be such such perfection and how 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 could I capture that line? And the idea of having limitations just wasn't it just wasn't a factor um, when you're very young like that. That was before the age when you start to think. Um, oh my goodness, my, 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 my drawings don't look good. So it was very pure, very simple. And it was simply a case of a very young person, um, a very small child saying, I want to be like this. And that's, there was, it was no more complicated than that. And I was very moved by the beauty that I saw in that work. And I had a similar experience with um, Goscony and Uderzo, the uh, work of Asterix. Again, it was the line that just really really attracted me um, and that went on um, and then obviously when you've got a particular talent for art it, you know it doesn't go unnoticed in school and all the other little girls and boys well not the boys but definitely the girls wanted me to draw their work for them boys don't want you to do their work for them <laughs> only girls okay. boys can do it better <laughs> so um well, they don't ask, you know, but the girls would always want me to draw the work for them. And, you know, it was it became part of my identity. You know, I'm good at hockey and I'm good at drawing, you know, um, um, and, and a little child will sort of feel what they're good at. And they know what they're good at because you, you stand out amongst your peers. Um, and that was great. And everything was fine. I was going along swimmingly, loving art, loving the whole world of beauty and color. Very simple, no pressure. Nobody telling me to do it better. Nobody telling me I was I was is no good um just very simple and straightforward and then oh and I I won all the prizes in school for art I mean any prizes that were there I got them so you can imagine I ha had a huge amount of self-confidence as a young person and I'm really glad I did because it prepared me for what was to come 
Mm-hmm. Because at 17, I went to my the, um, the main art college in Dublin mm-hmm. and they had a very different idea of what art was than I had experienced up until that time. They felt that art was, they had a thing called fine art, which they mm-hmm. regard as something that's very lofty, terribly serious, um, only for the very chosen few and um, not for, you know, not, not, not for people like me who saw a lot of humor in what I in what I like to draw. I liked very simple beauty and I also loved the beauty of the world as I saw it rather than some idea that I wanted to get down that was in my mind. So yeah, sure. It, by their by their definition, I certainly wasn't an artist. Um and 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 that that took root in me. I, I felt I'm not like these people. I'm not like these people, um, which was very negative. Um, um and I I turns out I wasn't the only one who felt that way. Mm. But um, it, I didn't, there was no positive that took its place that, well, I can't do that, but I can do that. So I left the world of art altogether. Um, and now when I say the formal world of art, obviously nothing was going to stop me continuing to draw and to make cartoons and to draw strip cartoons, um, which I continued to do all throughout my years after art college. And then when I went to do my science degree in my early twenties, um, I, again, did constant strip cartoons and I would have illustrated scientific papers for the lecturers and anything I had to draw in, in science wise, um, my drawings were very, were very nice. (laughs) Um, so we sometimes we'd have to draw skulls or bones or, um, my area, which was geology, you have to draw thin sections of pieces of rock. And of course mine looked very nice. Not that that was any benefit to me as a scientist, not at all, but anyway, that was fine. And then, um, I went on to do a master's um, and and I, I knew all along that art was going to be for me at some point in the future. And I knew that I was going to be famous and brilliant and all those wonderful things. But then t- life got in the way, I suppose, in the sense that I started having children. I started having a family and suddenly you learn that, you know, sometimes your time isn't for you when you're a mom your time is for those little people who need you and they, and when you've got a couple of them or three of them, as I do, there is always someone that needs you. There's always someone hungry. There's always someone who's tired, who needs a walk or whatever it is. So that was very, very difficult. Um, And when the youngest, I was very resentful of the fact that I had no time to do anything art wise. And I could see the years ebbing away. I could see time passing and I was beginning to get a bit panicky. I was getting, beginning to get a bit panicky because I had this big idea of what was going to happen mm-hmm. and it just wasn't happening. But it was much worse than that because there was a kind of a mojo that I knew I was waiting to receive. That some way of some way of drawing with this fluid perfection and I hadn't got there yet. Um, and I mean, I could draw fine. There was no problem with that, but it wasn't the way my soul wanted to draw. And I hadn't managed to capture what my soul, my voice, I hadn't managed to find my own voice. And I found that very frustrating. And so meanwhile, I was applying to get illustration jobs and nine times out of 10, I was rejected. In fact, what am I saying? 99 times out of 100, I was rejected. I could get absolutely no success in terms of getting any work as an artist. I sold work um, through galleries on and off through the years. But, you know, I was really, really disappointed. All those years of promise looked like they were coming to absolutely nothing. And I was very, I was becoming quite um, frustrated and I was beginning to become bitter because I would see the success of other people who I didn't rate like I rated myself. So yes, I was becoming envious and bitter, which is not, which is not nice. It only hurts you. It doesn't hurt the other people. It hurts you. And it was hurting me. So that was fine. And then, well, it wasn't fine. And then I started a job where I was doing, um, handmade wedding invitations. Um, Mm -hmm. and I did that for about five years. Mm-hmm. It started in 2009 and I really enjoyed it. I would uh, make very elaborate, very beautiful, bespoke wedding invitations with the story of a couple's life on them. And again, very satisfying. It was a very good job, paid very well. And I thought for a, for a while that I'd never do anything else. Mm-hmm. But then in 2012, my family and I moved to Mauritius. Mm-hmm. And um, I was there for about three weeks 
when um, I I opened a birthday present that my mum had sent over with me in my suitcase. And it was Danny Gregory's Everyday Matters. And as I sat by the pool with the palm trees all around and the turquoise water in the hot sun, I suddenly just looked up and I said, why am I not sketching? So I went and got my bits and pieces that I brought with me, my art pieces. I didn't bring very much. And my sweet little children had given me lovely birthday presents um, and, and, and just did like a little cup, a fan and a Tintin book in Creole, <laughs> Mauritian Creole for my little boy. And so I just started drawing them. Um, and I felt there was no pressure. Nobody was going to want a picture of a Tintin book. Nobody's going to want a picture of a, of a, of a cup with a map of Mauritius on it. But it was for the sheer pleasure of drawing that I did this. It was for the sheer pleasure of it. And I suddenly knew at that moment, on that day, I knew my life was about to change. Um, I couldn't have known what was ahead, but I knew everything was going to change. And the funny thing was, it wasn't going to change because I was suddenly going to get, you know, fame and accolades. It was because I was going to just jump into this world of beauty and this world of sheer pleasing myself through line and color. Um, after a few days of drawing stuff around the house, I mean, we had a cyclone, I drew a tree in the cyclone palm tree and the electricity guys coming to fix it, <laughs> stupid things, you know, yeah. through the swimming pool. But then I took our little hire car and I started to drive all around the island of Mauritius mm -hmm. and I drew absolutely everything and anything I could, I could where, anywhere I could park my little car and I found the people were just so warm, so friendly. They were so relaxed. They were so zen. Um, and they really enjoyed watching someone draw. And I found that children would stand for maybe up to an hour behind me, just watching silence. So, um, I remember a little a, a school bus full of children, full of little boys. And they just formed a line on either side of me. And they stood completely still and quiet. Um, just watching and even the ones who didn't even know what they were standing there for they just stood there. <laughs> they couldn't even see me but it was so lovely it was so lovely and at the same time I started to write down my experience in Mauritius because I felt if I don't write down all these lovely adventures they'll be gone forever and as soon as I started to write them down I felt oh my god this is so fun writing is so fun it's as much fun to write down something that's happened as it is to draw it uh -huh. so that was a big surprise and then um, when I uh, later on that year, when I came back to Ireland, um, I discovered the urban sketching community, and um, I, I, I think it was the Art of Urban Sketching by um, Gabby Campanario. So those two books, um, Danny Campanar uh, Danny Gregory's and Gabby Campanario's, between the two of them. Um, they changed my life. They changed my life. And I owe both of those men um, a, a huge debt of gratitude. Um, and I keep, every time I meet Gabby, I just say, you know, I, I think I've stopped telling them thank you now, but I, I every time for a while I met, I would say, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so, so then, so I joined the urban sketching movement and I discovered that not only was it about um, drawing, but also they were very welcoming to a few words to say about your experience, um, you know, just to bring it to life more. <laughs> and I found that that came very naturally to me. And then over the years, it happened quite quickly. And um, when I first started drawing, I drew, um, when I first started urban sketching, I drew everything in pencil and then I went on top of it with a pen. But uh, little by little, I um, gained in confidence um, and eventually I stopped drawing any prepar prep preparatory, preparatory lines in pencil and I just jump in with, with pen now. And that's the way I like to draw. Um, and when I teach, that's, that's how I, when I teach online, everybody just follows me and they just jump in with pen and they can't believe that they can do that, which is... The reason it's important is because, I mean, sure, you can draw something perfect, perfect if you draw it in pencil first. But the reason I like my, my students and so on to draw in pen is because it's, um, it's like you accelerate your own voice. Your voice comes much more quickly, your own natural human, your own personal voice. Um, so after a few years of uh, just a couple of years of being an urban sketcher, and I mean, I was drawing a lot. But after a couple of years, um, I realized that my voice at long last was coming through loud and clear. Um, and, and I realized that the, I was the exact same person. Uh, in my 40s that I was as a little as a little girl I just wanted to draw lovely drawings that were funny and looked cute so um so that was that was a big 
that was that was a big surprise for me and it was it was a wonderful thing to discover wow i i, I was thinking please go on i'd like to hear more <laughs> well i have more but i have to clear my throat <laughs> <laughs> but you took me through a journey of a lot of peaks and valleys in your career as an artist and one in particular was let me, let's go back a little bit when you applied for this for the school and they have a different interpretation of art and it it made you feel as if the, the art that you have been making wasn't enough how did you transition from that experience because you continued on creating. yeah i did well there's two a few things happened i i mean i did get into the college and i was very excited to be there yeah. um it was only once i became a student there and bear in mind i was only 17 years old Yeah. And I realized that I found my tribe. Everybody in my year, mm -hmm. it was foundation year. So we were just 90 kids together, um, divided up into four groups. And it was like, it was like going to the best party you've ever been to in your life. Because it was just wild. The sense of excitement mm -hmm. of we were all these, we were all the same types. We were all very outgoing, very extrovert, very, very, very strong opinions on the world. And I was with fat people who were just like me, just just as the same in urban sketchiness, the exact same type of people. Yeah. Um, and I only found out, so they stripped my confidence completely. So that was the first step. And they made us cry. They made me cry. They told me my work was, they used bad words, beginning with S, to say that's my work. Um, and any confidence that I had up to that point was gone. I found out some years later, step two, I found out some years later that I was in the top three um, of the people who got in that year out of 90. Um, they could have told me, you know, they could have told me and maybe not made my confidence go so, so, so crushingly mm -hmm. to the bottom. Um, and then step three was the fact that I was never going to stop drawing because I can't help it. I just can't, I can't stop. I mm -hmm. can't help it. Even though, even though, I mean, it was completely separate to, the, to their, to, the, I wasn't the artist that they defined as an artist, but I still went on drawing the way I wanted to, just for the pleasure. Mm -hmm. But the final step was the mature realization that they actually did do a lot for me. They actually did show me a different way to think. Mm -hmm. And I do actually, surprisingly to myself, I actually do owe them a lot for what they did. They showed me a whole new way to think. And it didn't feel good. And I certainly didn't like being... Um, put down and being uh, having my work insulted but that was that was their stuff that was nothing to do with me yeah. um but definitely that made it that made a big difference I'm in I'm in urban sketchers everything's going really well I've become completely obsessed with sketching we're on to about 2015 by now and then 2015 I taught my first workshop mm -hmm. um and it was in um my county my county Galway and there was only three people who came um and one of them was my sister In fact, was there four? No, there was four people who came. And one of them was my sister. And she only stayed for about, I don't know, 10 minutes. <laughs> Sisters. <laughs> she knows she did. She, she stayed for, for a half a day. And that was lovely to have her. <clears throat> my sister is a professional artist and she's incredible. But the, the three people who, who attended, we had such a, a good time. And I really loved being with them. And I loved teaching. And one of them said, you know something, you're a natural. And I thought, What? But I'm having such a good time. How could this be a job that I enjoy so much? Mm -hmm. And then the next year, um, I did a very big workshop with two Canadian artists who are just exceptional, uh, Mark Holmes and Shari Blaukopf. Um, and, 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 I, and I realized that was the beginning of my teaching, my life as a teacher. Mm -hmm. But um, I still didn't quite fully have the confidence To, oh. to, to be able to pass on what, what I had. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose just in the ensuing years, things began to build. I began to teach more and more and more. And then I taught in um, Porto in the, in the 2018 Urban Sketching Symposium. And that was an absolute blast. It was just the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, the best party you've ever been at. <laughs> and, then, um, and then in 2000, and late that year, I got my first contract to write my first book. Um, and that was an urban sketchers Galway. So it's based as a memoir, an illustrated memoir of life in this town on the west of Ireland. Um, to, uh, and you know, it's funny about confidence because the next year, when just when it came out, it came out in June 2019. And someone, someone sent me a text, a guy I'd worked for a couple of times. And he sent me a text and he said, um, congratulations, you've, you, you're, you're number one in Galway. Your book is number one. And I said, 
I said, well, I, I, even though we had a professional relationship, he was just a client I, I'd worked for. Yeah. I thought he was joking. Why would I think he's joking? Why would someone send a joke like that? I just assumed he he was not being serious. Mm-hmm. But the, he sent me a photograph of my book on the number one bestseller, bestseller shelf. And only and he did a big circle around it. And only because he did that, then I then I could believe it. Mm-hmm. But, but, but why why would I why would I think this is a joke? I mean, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Like even with all my confidence, I still didn't believe yeah. this incredible thing could happen. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was true, and my book was number one for the entire summer in the whole of the city, which was incredible after being rejected about. 200 times by publishers Mm. and I just wanted to shake them and say no you just have to try me you just have to try me but that doesn't mean they 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 don't if you don't know people if you don't mix with them if you you know you have to be very lucky to be to to get it to get a contract and in the end the contract I did get from Curric Press in 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 Dublin that was a big chance on their part Mm. they didn't know whether it was going to go well or not so they took a big risk And then in the, um, 2020, um, I was um, I published the um, Urban Sketching Handbook, mm-hmm. the Drawing Expressive People, and that came out in December 2020. So I spent much of the pandemic just writing that book. And that was a big treat because drawing people is, is a big thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and at one point, like most of my drawings of people are my family, my kids, my husband, my sisters, my family, so on. And I did wonder at some stage, this is all very personal and intimate. Do, do I really want to share my own children, my, my babies? Do I want to share them in this book that's going out into the world? And then I thought, but that's the whole point. The whole point is to share these beautiful moments with your beautiful families and your beautiful friends and just the simple everyday moments of life and how could I not share that and hopefully inspire someone to want to do the same thing so I'm really glad I did that I'm really really glad I included all those pictures if you buy the book you will know my entire family everything about me because they're all there there. so um that was a really nice thing to do and I I'm very I'm very honored and grateful and very proud to have been able to 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 write that book And then finally, my last book came out in, um, well, I started it in 2019. Mm -hmm. And of course, like everybody else, I had to stop. Um, And I couldn't go to Dublin to to write the book because of, you know, couldn't go anywhere. Um, And I was a bit nervous for a while that it wasn't going to, it wasn't actually going to get done. But um, in the end, I managed to sneak off to Dublin a couple of times and then I was able to go legally. Um, and um, and I got the book finished and it came out at Dublin and Sketches and Stories. It came out in October of 21. And um, yeah, I'm, I love that book. I'm very proud of it. That's the third one, right? That's the third one, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Roshi, for sharing your story. I picked up a lot from, from that journey alone. First was what, what we talked about earlier, that rejection. And what what's really inspiring about your story is that you kept going despite those rejections. You mentioned like 99 out of, you know, there's so many. But then you were given another chance, an opportunity. Someone took a risk. Now, when it comes to rejection, and I know this is a very sensitive topic for a lot of people who are starting out with art, whether it's just a hobby and someone gave a nasty comment, whether they pose it on the gram, or someone saw it and oh, it's not good, it's not for you, you shouldn't try it. What do you think was your catalyst that really kept you going? I know, of course, that since at a very young age, you love to create. You've all you sat at seven, you've already been training with a master's. But what was that catalyst that kept you going despite this knows that you have gotten in this course of your artistic training. Yes, and you have to understand that it wasn't just the publishers and the uh, agents that turned me down in their hundreds. It was my own family. Mm-hmm. My husband told me that he, he would say, and my husband's wonderful, and you know we were very close, but he would say, when are you going to give up? When are you going to stop trying? When are you going to give this up? And I would often, I mean, he didn't make me cry. I made me cry because I just kept thinking about, I was just so frustrated that all I got was no's. Yes. Um, my uh, my mother told me at one point, um, she said, your dad and I, your, your dad and I are really, really impressed the way you never give up. But I was kind of like, but 
what else can I do? I can't do anything else. I mean, I had a master's in geology, but I didn't, I knew that if I'd continued in geology, my art thing would never happen because if you, you know, if you open one door, then you can't go through another at the same time. So I knew that, um, and I had started as a PhD, but I, I was very happy when I had to give it up because I just couldn't do it. I was, I just, I just, couldn't it was too boring sorry guys too boring. I chose the wrong topic I love geology but I my topic was just not it was not for me it was terrible um but that's my that's my shortcoming but uh so I I, I felt very unemployable I, I I couldn't any jobs that I applied for I got turned down I mean I'm not just talking art jobs I'm talking any jobs any jobs I couldn't get employed I don't know why <laughs> but like that really really knocks your confidence that no even now even now nobody's going to give me a job I mean as an artist you have to make your own job that's just the way it is <laughs> so what happens is so first of all why did I continue what was the catalyst because I had no choice <laughs> number two because nobody else would give me any money to, to work that was the first reason. If I wanted money, I had to do, I had to keep going. It was my only chance of getting somewhere. Number two, I went on because I knew I was good at it. And I knew, you know, like if I, I felt that, I felt that I would keep trying, even if it took me till my deathbed. And I used to have, because I'm, I'm, I, I used to be a very melancholy person until I started being a big sketcher. And now I'm really happy all the time. <laughs> That's a big thing. Yeah. But I used to picture myself on my deathbed lying there, you know, old, oh. and I still wouldn't have got anywhere. You know, I still would have failed completely. And I'm lying there and I'm thinking all those years I've spent my entire life in pursuit of something that came to nothing. Mm. How would that feel? And I realized that's just the way it's going to be. Mm. That's just the way it's going to be because I'm not going to stop trying. I can't, I can't stop trying. So, so I kept trying and eventually I had, the jackpot in this in the form of um well I was going to say the publishers but that wasn't the jackpot the jackpot was urban sketchers yeah. finding that group that community that was my that was winning the lotto for me mm -hmm. because it was a place where nobody said hey you're not being arty enough you could do anything you wanted mm -hmm. and as long as it was true and real and drawn from life mm -hmm. and preferably comes with a bit of a story then everybody welcomed it um, and and we're not about we're not about whether you draw well or draw badly. We're we're about being there and capturing the moment. That is very much who we are. Mm -hmm. Um and, and then and then when the pandemic came along and I had to teach online because I couldn't go in my workshops anymore, I a very amazing thing happened, which I'm sure happens in the etcher community as well, that myself and my students, we, we really love each other very much. And it's it's very real thing it's a very magical thing and they know how happy they become from sketching I know how happy it makes them to be sketching and I just want to facilitate that for them and make give them loads of tips to make it easier yeah and and, and that has built my confidence over the years and now like I still get rejected I, I applied for um I, I sent in some pieces for a, an Irish magazine a literary magazine and um a, a couple of about two months ago and I just got news that I got rejected a few days ago I don't care. Well, I do care a bit. I care a little bit, but I forgot about it after about 10 minutes and just got on my job, my, my drawing, my sketching. Um, and, and somebody sent me an email the other day. She said, uh, she said, my mom is, 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 is quarantined at home. She, she's got COVID and she's asymptomatic, but she's quarantined at home. My dad is in hospital and I can't visit him. And she said, I'm not telling you this because it's a sad story. I'm telling you this because I want you to know that for 90 minutes, I forgot all my cares, my worries. And I just was thinking about drawing and the beauty of the color and the line. And that is the gift that we as teachers can give. And what a privilege that is. What a privilege that is. So that is the single, I'm going to say the best thing I've ever done, by far the best thing. It, 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 by far it, career wise it's just it gives me enormous satisfaction to be of some service to to the people who want to pick up a few tips so that's where I am now that's really beautiful and profound of uh, coaching one because you used your voice and it took you a while to get there but when you finally found your voice you kept going and you mentioned that the, you still face rejection, but what I love about you and the, your story is that you embrace it. And I remember reading from your feed that you did you visited your homeschool, your your um there was school that you visited, and then you 
had to speak in front of the people and you're you were talking to your girls I think your daughters and you were giving them this piece of advice and and then at the latter part of that conversation you did mention I know just one more thing is that you really have to embrace failure can you share a little bit more about that and I was just blown away by by that you reaching out to these people and that's is really inspiring and that like what you said that's really the true beauty of what you do to be able to share your experiences and inspire other people to continue on with that journey, even though other people are saying no. I will tell you something as well, Jesse. I meant to say it. The girls that I was talking to, they're a bit young, I think, to hear it. Um, I, I, I practiced my what I was going to say on my own 17-year-old daughter. Oh. And I told her that I wanted to tell them about um, being a mother. But my daughter said, no. No, no, no. And I was like, but I want to, I want to. Because it seems to be such a taboo to mention motherhood. And what I would like to have said to the girls, and I'll tell you what I did say to them in a second, but what I would have liked to have said was, if I have a sense of humour, it's because being a mother teaches you not to take yourself too seriously. If I put others first, sometimes it's because I have the habit of doing that. Like when I first had babies, I I, I didn't feed them when, if, when I was hungry. I fed myself. And then I'd have to realise, hang on, if I'm hungry, it's a good chance they're hungry too. So being a, being a mother really forces you to stop being, you know, putting yourself first. Um, and and if 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 I'm if I'm able to capture the beauty of the world, it's because again, being a mother makes you realize that these little moments are so precious. Um, and they they might be simple, small moments, but they're really beautiful moments. And also, also the whole thing with failure, like you are going to fail at a lot of things in life, unless you just have this, I don't know, magical spirit on top of you. I don't know. But failure is really, really good for you. It's really good for you, even though it feels horrible at the time. And I remember one of my big failures was when um, I took my, I went to, I, I started my science degree as a mature student. So I was in my early twenties and in Ireland that counts as a mature student. And I, I just thought, okay, I'll give it a go. And if I can't do it, because I hadn't opened a science book since I was 15 years old. And I was horrified when I realized that they were going to force me to do chemistry and maths and physics. I just couldn't believe it. I, you know, I draw pictures. <laughs> so, um, so when I failed um, uh, uh, my physics in first year um, and I had to repeat it in the summer, I thought, that's it. I'm not going to do it again. I, I, I've given it my best shot. I'm not going to do it again. And my father said to me, no, he said, you've come this far just keep trying keep trying keep trying but I remember the day I got the the news that I'd failed I just felt horrible and the the guy I was with at the time was saying oh come on it's not so bad no, no, no. and I said well it's okay for you you've got first class honors the whole way through you know you can't you can't tell me don't be worrying about failing when you've just aced everything the yeah. whole way up mm -hmm. so um so I know what it feels like to fail and I know what it feels like to be constantly rejected constantly turned down and you just have to find that place inside yourself that says okay what am I going to learn from this try and be humble try and say okay maybe I did mess up I mean I know that all the, those those projects that I submitted to publishers over the years that got turned down they were probably terrible in fact a lot of them definitely were terrible so you know sometimes I expected them to read my mind you know and just know that I had this brilliant idea without actually showing it to them so I had to learn from that failure do it again, do it properly and don't waste their time, um, which, I, which I was for sure, <laughs> poor things. Um, and you know, and you have to, you do, you, you, you have to contend with all kinds of things. You have to deal with family problems. You have to deal with just not being in control of life, but you have to accept that. And ex I mean, if we could all accept things, my God, we'd all be so much better off. But um, I also realized that I mean, people, so I, I don't know, people talk about the joy, the secret of a happy life is making other people happy. Mm -hmm. That is the secret. That is the secret. Um, and I, that certainly come to me through teaching. Um, nothing gives me more peace and joy than making my students happy. And it's my, it's a huge privilege for me. I have a follow up question to what you just said, because I was reading through your bio and something, there was a line there that was, God, this is really, I have to ask for what, what she meant by that. You said that the success your success is measured by the loss of your students. And if someone will read through that and would say, what does she mean by oh, that? Oh, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah Good. I'm, glad, I'm glad you noticed that because, yeah. So yeah. what happened was I, I had this... Mm -hmm. 
I had this student and she's wonderful. She's a wonderful woman. And we became friends. Mm -hmm. And um, when she told me that she was going to leave my classes, my, my immediate reaction was, oh. And then she said, it's because I have so much confidence to do my own thing, my own way now. And I knew that where she was coming from because she was always her her style was always very very um artistic and very crazy and um I'm really glad she didn't stay with me because I would hate her to have 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 had to um let's say dilute her craziness her craziness was just beautiful Mm -hmm. and it was something that I could never do I don't have that craziness everything I do is very controlled um so I was really glad when she cut the cut the ropes and just flew off by herself I was really really happy to see her do that um and every now and she hasn't left the community group that we're in and she makes comments every now and then but um I'm just so happy that and she's still a friend of mine I I love her to bits and I'm really glad that we've we've met we've met each other um but yeah no that so then I realized gosh the more people I can have coming to me for maybe a year or something like that and then not come to me anymore because they're doing their own thing I mean sometimes they stop coming because you know they've got other commitments in their lives um or they just lost the habit or lots of reasons but if they've stopped coming because they now have taken the wheel by themselves that is just the best that is just the best thank you for explaining that I thought that that was when I was reading I thought I have to ask Roshan what she meant by the success her success is not hurt by the loss of and you're absolutely right as a teacher right for you to be able to see, like for, for moms, right? For you to be able to see your yeah. kids grow up and make a life of their own. That's, that means that you did your job well. As exactly, a exactly, as exactly. A right now, be able to fly and have the confidence to, get, to go out in the world and do their thing and express themselves um, on their yeah. own. Yeah, so that's, that's really wonderful. And I mean, it's 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 a different thought process altogether. So I was when I was reading it, this is really interesting. For some teacher, they would want their students to stay on, so that they can guide. But for you, it's you giving them, empowering them to rely on. Their yeah, own. I mean, I think that's. I mean, when I'm teaching online, and the same for any of the teachers with Etcher as well. I mean, we it's not it's not the same as teaching in person when they are doing a completely different subject than you. They're copying what exactly what you're doing. So I try within that, I try to teach them as many technical tips as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. I try to, because everything I do, I do from life. So I try to tell them what the physical challenges were on the day. So mm-hmm. for example, whatever I was going through, whether it was yesterday's class, I told them about being distracted by a really nice man who came to talk to me. And he was talking to me for long enough that it meant I couldn't change the subject because my my picture wasn't working out yeah. and because I lost my moment to change and do something else because he was talking to me and 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 as it happened I was able to I was able to rescue the first sketch and it, it came out really nicely in the end mm-hmm. um but but um you you just never know what's going to happen you you know um the, 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 the light might change or whatever so I try to um I tr- and I try all the time I try all the time to say you know, you do it your way, you do it your way. All I'm doing is is trying to show you a few tips, but if you want to use big black markers, fine. If you want to use, you know, chalk, that's perfect. I don't, that doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever feels natural to you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I tell them some classes will feel better for you and some classes will feel less natural for you. So, um, and the ones you should come to are the ones that feel less natural because um, then you're leaving your comfort zone and we all need to get out of our comfort zone. And that's how I've progressed over the years is by my wonderful colleagues in the in the urban sketching world who've recommended I try some new technique or some mm-hmm. new tool. Um, and sometimes they sit on my desk for a year before I pick them up. And with the food a pen, I had one for a whole year. And then finally I started using it. And now I only use them. I mean, mm-hmm. only exclusively. And I have about, I don't know, 10 in my pencil case, all with different colored inks. Um, you know, and, and I'm I'm ready for a new challenge now because I have become very set in my what I'm doing. So it's 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 a wonderful thing to have the community and we encourage each other to to be ourselves uh, we all we want as teachers is for your voice to shine through we don't want you to draw like me or like your teacher whoever that is um i know people will look at the work of my students and they can probably guess that i've been teaching them um but i i i would love them i would love them to do their their own thing and be themselves right. that's what i really want 
Mm-hmm. And I suppose if, if I can encourage the habit above all, if I can, if I can encourage them to get obsessed, well then they'll do it by themselves. Yeah. I, I, I like the other point that you make about the community as well. And what I've heard as well from you, Hoshin, is that you continue with a journey, meaning there's so much to learn. And you said that you've also tried different materials, mediums, techniques even. And I guess that's, that's really what the journey is all about. It's, it's never ending. You continue to learn one thing and Having you as a teacher, that's sort of, if, I, if I'm to attend your class, which I know you have a lot, tomorrow you're going to be busy, I'm sure, because you have online and then on-site classes. It, it's really refreshing to be able to hear that from someone who is teaching a technique and to say that I am also learning. I'm, in, I'm you know, I'm a work in progress still. And there's still so much to learn. And there's vulnerability in that, that for most of them, I resonate with that. And I know yeah. there's still a lot that you can, that I can learn from you. Well, I'll tell you something, Jesse. Very interesting. Um, last night, one of my uh, one a, t- a fellow teacher came to my class, mm-hmm. and she's a, she's a friend of mine, and I love her very much. She's German. She's called Nicola Meyer Reimer, mm-hmm. and I love her work. She's amazing. She's super gifted. And my husband said to me this morning, he said, "That's really unusual for another artist to come to your class and be taught by you." And I said, "Yeah, but she's special. She she doesn't let her ego get in the way, you know." Um, and 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 I. I found it so humbling that such a talented artist would want to be in my class. And I mean, we have a lot of fun, you know, so I, I hope, I think she enjoyed it. We had a good laugh. Um, my takeaway tip, by the way, from that class is draw. So if your drawing is going really badly, just draw so much stuff that there's so much, so much bad stuff that the person can't, can't see, like they can't tell. So my analogy was like, if a lion is chasing like a herd of wildebeest, he doesn't know which one to choose because there's so many of them. So that's it. Just draw so much stuff that no one can tell which is the bad one. So I said this to my daughter and she said, so what you're telling your student is just like draw loads of wildebeest. <laughs> I said, yeah, just draw loads of wildebeest. But um, anyway, I was thinking about it and I thought, um, she's the only f- fellow artist who's ever come to one of my classes and she's come before. I have come to lots of, the, um, well, I've actually signed up for a couple of extra classes. That one I went to with the amazing um, Ellie uh, Doughty. I never know how to pronounce her surname. She's mm-hmm. just amazing. Um, and it's wonderful as an artist to go to a fellow artist class because it forces you to draw a different way. Um, and they're such they're so talented and so skilled um, that it's it's a joy to be there. So I love being on the other side of the camera as well. I mean, when I attended her class, it was nine o'clock in the evening in in Ireland, mm-hmm. and um, I had a bottle of beer. Um, it was a beautiful summer's evening, and I just thought, oh my god, this doesn't get any better. I'm drawing. I'm following someone's lovely voice, and she's telling me what to do. It's beautiful. <laughs> this is why people come to her classes because they're just amazing. Mm-hmm. I love, I love that. And thank you for sharing that. I know there are a lot of artists. I have a lot of artist friends as well, mostly watercolor artists. And well, what, what we normally do is attend someone or attend each other's workshops. But yeah. But that's for support or just to be there and learn something new. It's just, it's, it's that's the beauty of community. It's the beauty of yeah. being part of it. And for you, that's urban sculpture. Yeah, we've, we've done that in our, in our workshops as well. When we're physically, my, uh, myself and my pals, when we're often teaching Sometimes we don't have any time to go to each other's workshops, but sometimes we do. And it's such a joy to attend another another instructor's workshop because it, it, it really is very humbling and humbling is always brilliant. You, you all need humbling. Well, I certainly do. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, um, you you know, you get to learn a different way. So, but sorry, you were going to say something. No, I would just like also to touch on because you throughout the, the stories that I've heard from you, and by the way, the beautiful stories, inspiring, the confidence part. First, if I, I, I mean, I've been rejected more than once or twice already, and it would really shape your your confidence and ten, will leave you asking a lot of questions about your capabilities, your talent, what your, you know, is it really the right path that I'm supposed to be pursuing? What has kept your confidence intact? Okay, all the okay. I'm going to tell you the truth, Jesse. Mm-hmm. My my husband just thinks I, you know, am the sun, the, the moon, and the stars. And that doesn't mean he's always polite and nice, okay? Uh-huh. okay? But I know deep down he just, you know, he just thinks the world of me. 
And he, he, he I've, I've always felt very, we all need a hero to back us up. And my father was that rock when I was growing up. He he always just said, you know, oh, you're so amazing, you're so brilliant. And I I I got into a lot of trouble as a young adult. I you know, I, I'm going to say I mixed with the wrong types, but they were mixing with me too. So I'm sure I was the wrong type as well. But um, <laughs> I mean, come on, it works both ways. But um, all the time through those really dangerous times, because I really was, you know, in bad places. I always used to think, you know, your dad thinks you're amazing. Your dad thinks you're amazing. And then when I met my husband, um, he 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 laughs at all my jokes. I mean, what can I say? He he laughs at all my jokes. And if he doesn't, then there's a problem. Okay. <laughs> there's a problem. You better be listening. He didn't to laugh that. at a joke this morning. I was very angry. <laughs> but um, so the confidence and the other thing I do, and this anybody can do this, anybody who's lucky enough to have um, kids or, or close friends whenever you're joking about something with like a meme or something like that, I just draw a little picture to illustrate it. I photograph it and I send it by WhatsApp and everybody laughs. And that makes you feel brilliant. It makes you feel, wow. And you don't have, I mean, you should see some of these drawings. They're absolutely terrible, but that's not the point. The point is they make you laugh. They make your friends laugh. And, 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 and there's a great freedom to draw really badly. Um, when, when you when you do things like that, you know, it's just so much fun. It's so much fun. So I suppose to confidence, how would I say to keep your confidence? Um, it's a tough one. I mean, I used to write to the artists that I admired years and years and years ago. Mm-hmm. And I used to see that I used, I could tell by the way they drew that they had tons of confidence. And I wondered how do they have that confidence and some of them wrote back really famous people really good people to write back to somebody who was just nobody um and they would they would they would they would tell me I would say what tools do you use I was convinced if I had the tools mm-hmm. that I would also be yeah. brilliant mm-hmm. and that's actually not not a, that's not incorrect you do need the right tools you yeah. do because there's like a there's like a choreography between you and your tools like a dance and it has to be the right has to be the right uh, ingredients it really mm-hmm. does like me and my foodie pen I've changed completely since I use a 55 degree foodie pen, for example. Um, so you do have to have the right tools. That That's not nonsense, you know. But the confidence, I'm going to say my dad. I mean, to this day, mm-hmm. my dear dad, he's nearly 90. And uh, he still he still thinks I'm funny. And I think he's really funny. So, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, and also my older sister, um, my older sister told me about, 15 years ago, she made 20 years ago. She said, she said, just tell your, your story of your life. She said, you don't have to do anything else. Just tell the story of your life. The way you tell it is so, is so, is so funny. And my older brother, now it's important that they're my older sister, my older brother, because everyone's older brother and sister is generally, you know, they look down on you. (laughs) That's just the way the dynamic is. But my brother told me when he read the first thing I wrote, my, my older brother told me, um, he said, my God, he said, you write better than you draw. Now, he didn't think much of me as a drawer, I don't think. So maybe that wasn't such a huge compliment. But it, I took it as a big compliment. And I thought, wow, wow, I write. But then, you know, as I say, I still get rejected from publications. They don't they don't think much of me. So there you go. <laughs> it's all take it up. Sometimes they like you. Sometimes they don't like you. And you know what they say, treat failure and success as the imposters they both are. And if you can do that, you oh, yeah. And something else, by the way, this is a really good one. During all those years of failure, during those all, all those years of rejection, things were getting bad. I was getting really miserable, really depressed, and yes, jealous and bitter. But I had to have a little talk to myself and say, but I've already won because I live in this world full of color and line. I'm drawing all the time. I'm painting all the time. I've already won because this is a beautiful life. And then I thought, okay, everything else that happens after that is a bonus. And, and to this day, the best things I do, it's not, it's not the big checks or whatever, you know, once you become professional, that that you're if you're lucky enough, that comes anyway. Mm-hmm. The, the, the beautiful thing is sitting by the shore with that guy who stopped to talk to me about how he used to love drawing as a kid. Those moments, and I'm sloshing the indigo on making the shadows with my paints gray, and I'm watching the color combination together. And the sun comes out and casts a shadow exactly where I need it to be. And those that's what's beautiful. That's what's beautiful. Everything else is a bonus. I've been very lucky. Those little moments, right? That's yeah. so beautiful. Beautifully said. 
Uh, Thank you. I really enjoyed speaking with you. I, I learned so much, especially on the aspect of, and it's not because you failed a lot or that you received a lot of rejection. It's really more of how you position yourself after each no. I guess it's because you know in your heart what it is that you really want to do because you know that you have a voice and you want, it to, want, you want to be heard because you have something of value that you can share with the world. And you're absolutely doing it now with every student who signed up to your class, even the class Thank you. with Etcher. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Jesse. I just want to say um, I, you, you do have to have a lot of luck as well. And my mom giving me that book that day in Mauritius for my birthday, mm. she was always giving me art books, but that she was always giving me wonderful art books for presents. And sometimes they'd be interesting, sometimes they wouldn't be interesting. But that one changed everything. And then she also gave me the Gabby Campanario's book. So, you know, I have my mom to thank for always looking for a way to support me, you know, through the, all those, the, my artistic career. And, and I consider that a huge piece of luck. Um, and I still remind her, and she she knows, you know, you started it all, mom. So, um, and she was the one who took us to art galleries as kids and bought all those Astrid's books and all those Tintin books. You know, that was all her. So, um, so I've been very lucky to have a, a, a really, really, good support network and it's 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 very hard to 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 compete in a man's world for lots and lots of reasons and the older we get the more we find out that that's true but the the good things um oh yeah another thing there's a huge advantage to being um, a middle-aged woman as an urban sketcher nobody notices you nobody gives a damn what you're doing so uh they don't see you so if they don't see you they don't stop you (laughs) um and i've never felt in any way threatened all those years, all those thousands of sketches, I've never felt threatened in any way. So I don't know. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roisin. And just one final question before we end, and I wish we yeah. could have more because I love listening to all of your stories, um, especially your how you reach this point where you're content, you're happy, and you're filled with joy doing what you love. For anyone who might be who's probably thinking that oh, I cannot draw, I cannot sketch. There's just, you know, I don't have talent. I do have the tools, but I don't think anyone would appreciate if I did try it. What sort of golden nuggets can you share with them? Okay, here's what I'd say to them. If you're human, you're creative. That's what we, we that's who we are. Mm-hmm. Humans are creative. Um, And what's more, we're creative in our own unique way, each of us. And if you can write your name, if you can, if you can do handwriting, then you can make a shape. That's just the way it is. There's no question about that. If you can write your name, if you don't sort of make a complete, you know, I don't know, write Timothy Smith when you're trying to write Johnny, whatever, Murphy, then, then you can make a shape. If you can make those, if you can make those lines match what you're trying to, 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 to write, then you can draw. It's simple as that. If you can write, you can draw. So um, you can, anybody can make a shape. It doesn't necessarily going to be, it's not necessarily going to be very accurate, but um, start with, you know, something that doesn't have a good shape. Like, I don't know, uh, 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 in Ireland, we have lots of dry stone walls and each stone doesn't have a particular shape. It's just a round block. So if you can find something that isn't going to scream at you, if you don't get it perfectly right, just go ahead and get out there. Bring your little stool, bring a hat if it's too sunny, bring a warm coat and a, and a woolly hat if it's too cold or draw from your car. Draw your what's what you see in your rear view mirror. I've done that and it's really good fun. I think I saw that. Um, yeah, put put a put on a podcast, put on put on put on some music. You know, you'll be carried away, you'll forget your troubles. And even if what you do isn't great, there's always a next time. I wouldn't worry about it. Just enjoy the process. Love it. Or you can sign up a class as well. So I did want to say <laughs> you can sign up for class and have some fun while you learn. And uh, both that year and myself keep it, we keep it very reasonably priced. So it's for everybody. That is absolutely true. Well, thank you so much, Rishi, for um, speaking with me, sharing your story. I love every bit of it. And for doing what you do uh, for our community, um, especially for those who want to start out making art. And this is going to be our 101 episode of this podcast. And I'm just excited for you to listen to this 
um, episode, I'm sure you're going to pick up a lot from our conversation. So, Lilith, thank you so much. I know you're a busy thank girl. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks but so much for having me. Else. Yeah, so please take care and I'll speak to you again soon or watch any of your classes online. Thank you, Jesse. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye now. Roisin's journey is a beautiful story of growth, resiliency, and passion. She allowed her unique voice in art as her catalyst to pursue what she loves and serve others. What do you think about this episode? Do let us know by leaving a comment through the blog post associated with this podcast at etrolab.com slash Roisin. We would love to hear your thoughts, so please drop us a five-star review on the Apple Podcast or you can find us on YouTube at Etro Studio. And, oh, hitting the subscribe button is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you again next time. Until then, let's make more art.